Hi, this is Nina Budiraja, and I'm here today to talk to you about uh, seeking that next hockey hockey stick stick growth uh, by rediscovering your users. It was the summer of 2016 in Bangalore, India. Ride-sharing apps had taken the country by storm. Ola and Uber were both competing head-on in order to provide customers uh, the best, most affordable, most convenient commute options. The team at Ola was debating whether to uh, experiment with shared cab rides. It'll never work, was the consensus. Nearly every user research that we had done came back with uh, this, the realization that the average Indian would rather take public transportation options than share a cab with uh, strangers. Um, safety was a particular issue for one focus group, women. And uh, without that focus group, the economics of the shared cab ride would never be sustainable, thereby killing the category itself. But something sparked in our gut. We felt like we knew our users more than what weeks of research were, were telling us. Uh, we, we knew that safety was important, but we also knew that this user was extremely price sensitive. So we hacked together the nightmare of a pilot. We completely manually called a driver telling him where to go next and called our customers on the other side, telling them what to expect next. This pilot actually took off. Uh, our cabs from airports, universities, IT parks all started leaving full and with a fair gender ratio. Uh, this, this was the birth of Ola Share, in, despite all of the user research uh, indicating that it would not take off. Within the first year, Ola Share grew to be 25% of the company's business. Now, a few months down the line, our hands were itching again. How could we grow share even further? So in most T1 cities, uh, the daily commuter took uh, public transportation options like buses. Could we possibly come up with, uh, uh, with possibly compete with uh, public bus service, particularly along fixed routes across the city? A cab ride would surely be better experience for the same price I would get a guaranteed seat and could reach my destination with fewer stops. So begin hours of user research. We stood on street corners, bus stops, asking people why they took the bus and given an option whether they would take a cab. The response was an overwhelming, of course. So we launched Ola Share Express. It was an epic failure. It floundered even a year after its launch. Why? Two reasons. The price sensitive bus user that we were targeting was not on the app. They were not on any app. Um, the people who were on the app were willing to you know, pay a little extra to be picked up and dropped off from their doorstep. But two, more importantly, the mental model of a user uh, with cab services was a door to door pickup rather than I am willing to walk that extra step uh, up to a meeting point. This was a habit that we had formed uh, when, when uh, Ola was founded a couple of years ago. So, you know, let's take a pause here. In our first story, user research told us that something would not work, and yet it took off. And in our second story, user research said something would obviously work. In, despite all investment, um, it floundered and finally collapsed. Were we just bad at doing user research? So it turns out that user research is an extremely complex beast. You truly get what you seek. In both of these stories, we were treating our users like mm, users. We uh, were carefully uh, crafting our questions in order to uh, assess the actual pain point of the user and to see whether our solution would, would solve that pain point. Um, but our methods had a basic flaw. We lacked empathy. We didn't know anything about the user beyond those 30 minutes of user research interview. We didn't know um, where the user lived, uh, who was in his household, what his decision-making framework was, um, who he was influenced by, uh, and so on. Our user research was only focused on the problem we were trying to solve and then our solution. Now, let me tell you another story. This is a story of a Google engineer, Prasad. Prasad and his team uh, founded the Google Station product. 
this product provided free Wi-Fi at over 400 railway stations across the country, across India, and inspired many, many people to come online. We were, we were um, uh, facing, we would read countless stories. For example, uh, Srinath, uh, uh, porter by trade, was able to clear the Kerala public commission exams by you know, studying online in his downtime. Or Helen, an auto rickshaw driver, every time she would stop by the station, she would download extra content in order to help her child uh, with his high school exams. Uh, but, but Prasad, our engineer, he wasn't convinced. He wanted to make sure that the user experience for that very last user was indeed very seamless. And that we were not just sitting in our plush, comfortable corporate chairs, um, in, impressed with the numbers. So uh, he decided to test it out. He started his 30-hour journey from New Delhi railway station all the way down to Chennai Central. And at every station, this guy would wake up. He would take out his spade of Android devices representative of our user base, and he would try to connect to the Wi-Fi. Now, he, he came across several, several corner case bugs, um, and he came, came across a few ideas to improve products. But most importantly, by observing our users in the wild, he says that he was able to develop user empathy. So when he came back and he was sitting at his desk to make some of these technical decisions, he could, he could lean back on that empathy rather than just relying on a product requirements doc supplied by his product manager. What's the big takeaway? Our users are our family. Only when we get to know our users like our brothers and sisters, will we be actually able to understand their pain points and come up with solutions that solve them. But is observing our users in their natural habitat sufficient? Uh, what if there are things that we're not able to observe? For instance, the user may not think that something is important enough to talk about, or the user might be ashamed about a behavior and hence might hide it from us. How do we get to know such nuances? Let me tell you another story. Uh, this story is about a star product manager I had the privilege to come across at Ola. Pradeep. Pradeep joined our supply team at Ola and was asked to hit the ground running with quite a few initiatives. But the seasoned product manager that he was, he completely disappeared for the first couple of weeks in his new job. When he resurfaced, he came up, came up with a deck that uh, honestly just uh, blew our minds when he presented it. It formed the foundation of our uh, uh, year-long driver retention strategy. Now, what did Pradeep do? He didn't really do anything um, um, super scientific. All he did was tag along a driver. He convinced a driver to pick him up at 6 a.m. when his day started and convinced him to let him ride with him all day long until 11 p.m. when his day ended. Pradeep didn't really know what he was looking for, but he did know that as a supply PM, understanding his driver base, understanding the experiences that the driver went through either with the technology that we provided but more importantly outside that app uh, was what what he was gunning for now uh, pradeep's learnings were fascinating besides catching a few issues with that app like uh, zero state issues or low bandwidth issues um, he was able to uh, discover quite a few things in the driver's experience with our, with our platform that we wouldn't have been able to find in hours of user research interviews. Let me give you a few examples. So Pradeep found that our driver was super excited when he received back-to-back -to -back -to -back bookings on the platform. His utilization was through the roof that day, and he was so ecstatic about uh, the earnings he was going to receive the next day. But Pradeep also found that because the driver was getting back to back to back bookings, the poor guy did not have an opportunity to take a bio break. So in between a few rides, he would park his car, excuse himself from his customer and take a leak. How embarrassing, what an experience for both the rider as well as the driver. Thus was born the pause button on the driver app where the driver could essentially pause himself from getting his next booking for, the, for 10 minutes after the current ride ended without losing his incentives for the day. In another example, Pradeep found that cancellations were really high towards the night because drivers would reject bookings that ended up uh, not in their part of the town. 
And SAS was born uh, the last ride of the day uh, feature that the drivers could use once in the day, where uh, they would only be allocated bookings that ended in the vicinity of their home. So um, the big takeaway, what drivers told us mattered and helped us improve the platform, but what they didn't tell us mattered even more. These little features in our app didn't go unnoticed. Driver experience improved, driver retention improved, um, and these improvements were nearly impossible for our global competitor to discover and emulate, thereby giving us an edge in the market. Even though we didn't pay top dollar, we were able to win the supply game nearly all of that year due to the loyalty generated from little features like the ones that we just discussed uh, embedded within our driver experience. So let me switch gears a little bit. Um, we've been talking about Ola Cabs, uh, the number one ride sharing app in India. But before it got here, do you all know about its humble beginnings? Ola started out as an intercity riding app. Once they received the bookings for the day, the founding team would gather and start calling drivers in order to uh, uh, realize all those bookings that they had just made. They even did in-person inspections of all of these cabs to make sure their quality met the standards that they were shooting for. Only when the number of rides that they could take on the platform had crossed a certain threshold and they saw a path to profitability, this team invested in um, hiring and growing tech teams to create seamless customer experiences, as well as machine learning to optimize uh, and, and achieve operational efficiencies. The point here, as technologists, as product managers, as engineers, it's so easy to rush into a solution. The min viable product assumes that we understand the user's problem well and their decision framework even better. This is an expensive assumption. We spend months building out the MVP only to struggle to see it adopt. What if we could do things differently? What if we could put something quick, dirty, hacky in our users' hands? What if we could observe our users use this, this hacky solution and tweak it until such a time that they actually like the product? So this might take us longer to write those finalized product requirements docs or to create a, a, a PNL or financial projections for this product, but wouldn't this eventually speed up time to market? Let me give you an example here. Uh, at Google's next billion users division, we tried to create a supplemental income source for Kiryana shopkeepers um, in a world where they competed with online retailers. So for every customer that walked in to buy milk, a shopkeeper could also offer him digital products like uh, do a mobile recharge for him or book, book his railway ticket or place an online order for, for his customer. Now, our hands were itching in order to build a beautiful app and give this to our shopkeepers. Here's what we did instead. First, we went ahead and discovered whether our users or whether our shopkeepers would indeed cross sell such a digital product. The actual servicing of the product, we completely outsourced and had agents sit outside the shops to, to, to complete those services. Next, we then uh, went about discovering whether this shopkeeper could provide these services. So instead of creating our own technology, we gave the shopkeeper all the tech that existed, either ours or our competitors. Uh, for example, use GPay uh, in order to do mobile recharges, use Paytm to book uh, movie tickets, use IRCTC website to book railway tickets and so on. We Here we found a few things that were just broken for, for our shopkeepers and this was th these were areas that we could really improve upon. Next, we decided to understand our users' mindset, the end users' mindset, and we wanted to see if there was a way in which we could establish this Kiryana store as the everything store in their neighborhood. We started doing guerrilla research around viral marketing techniques. We tried one after the another, and within a few weeks, we found a few that really clicked. So in a nutshell, in about three months, with zero lines of code written, what had we done? We had figure out a problem that we validated was worth solving. We'd figure out where other products were failing and what we could do better. And we'd figure out how to market this offering. The point, unlearn the MVP, it's overrated. 
Ignore that itch to build the product and especially build for scale. Take that time instead to understand our users deeply, experiment with, bandage products first. Um, a few minutes ago, we, we heard the story about how Google Station was able to change several lives. I want to shift gears a little bit and now talk about how we were wrong. Um, it was a great product. Uh, we had cutting edge hardware and software. We were solving a massive connectivity problem uh, in, in the markets we were in. We'd launched in several developing countries, winning much PR and fanfare. Five years into the product, we decided to shut it down. Why? Well, first we were not able to establish a sustainable business model to continue offering the service. But second and more importantly, Reliance Geo in India and other such providers in the countries we were operating in had come in and our users were able to get online for much, uh, for much more accessible data plans. So it was a humbling decision, but our leadership was able to take the decision to shut down the product in favor of investing those resources for deeper in impact projects. So it's easy to get stuck in implementation details and focus on optimizations. This implies that we understand our user problem, it continues to remain static, and the environment around that problem continues to remain static. The truth could not be further. User behavior has changed, competition landscape evolves, the economy goes through ups and downs, all begging a sharp PM to continue to evaluate the effectiveness of their product. Unless done frequently, reassessed um, whether we are actually continuing to solve a user pain point, even the best of product decisions will turn out to be obsolete and eventually wrong. I shared a, quite a few stories here that have left a deep imprint on my product outlook uh, through my 14 years in technology. These are all not my stories. So first of all, I want to thank all the warriors who have braved several failures and have left us these stories and these lessons. But in summary, there are four key takeaways that I would love for you all to be equipped with along your next product journeys. First, our users are our families. We have to get to know them like our brothers and sisters, and not just in those brief user research interviews, if we have any chance at solving their pain points truly. Second, what they didn't say matters a lot more. Observe your users' unsaid needs and constraints they often shape their decisions a lot more than what they do express in interviews. Third, let's talk about zero te tech testing. MVPs are overrated. Let's try and unlearn our, our behavior. Let's try and patch together existing offerings, manual high touch solutions, and get an early read on our product ideas. And lastly, we could all be wrong. No matter how thorough the research, assumptions change, macro situations change, competition cre uh, does creep in, user needs and decisions change. What's relevant today can get outdated pretty soon. So keeping our ears to the ground and making sure that uh, we are continually reassessing our users' needs uh, can ensure longer term success. Thank you very much for your time and please feel free to reach out with any comments, feedback and thoughts uh, via LinkedIn. You can find me as Nina Budhiraja. Thank you.